Brian Howell here with Pro Video Coalition. I'm with Art Adams of Airy. We were talking about how you see you have a lens and you want to kind of get, you want to chase that image that you're really looking for, maybe some nets in the back, maybe a diopter. Well, luckily for us, Art has a ton of examples to show through and go through. Art, we're talking about making your image look a little special. Yeah, well, so Signature Primes kind of do that already, but we always kind of look at what's coming next as far as, um, you know, where display technologies are going. So what we did was we made really, really, really good lenses, but then we kind of backed in some extra stuff. So these lenses are, they're a little warm. They take the edge off skin tone. Uh, they don't eliminate flare. They kind of soften flare. They do some really nice things. They're not just a perfect lens. We started with a perfect lens, but then we backed some stuff into it. And that's a very different approach than starting with imperfections and then using those to build characters. We started with um, as close to perfection as we can get, but then we took the edge off some things and really crafted a look. But we also wanted to give people the option of very easily customizing the look. And we did that by putting this little net holder back here. So what you do is... And that's, those are magnets that are on the back of that net holder. Those are, yes. So there's a couple of cool things. Um, so magnets on the back of the lens. Uh -huh. And then at the top, you can see there's a witness mark. Okay. Right yeah, there, that that. Little, yeah. And then on the net holder, there is a witness mark as well. Uh -huh. Right there. So what you can do is you can do... If, if you have a fabric that has a weave uh, or a fishing line, if you want to put fishing line on for a fake anamorphic look, you can orient it a certain way using that witness mark as a guide. And then you could rotate this on all your lenses very quickly. So if you wanted to skew the, the effect a little bit one way or the other, you could do that across an entire lens set very quickly. Yeah, so if, and but, very quickly, you'd be like, hey, if I need just a slight 45 degree angle, then um, you can tell an AC to do that. And, and you can walk away, you're done. Even even an AC could do this, yeah. <laughs> Actually, what I usually say is even a DP could do this. Yeah, yeah. that's probably more likely. Even a DP who's not technical can do this, yeah. Like exactly, me. exactly, yeah. I, you know, it's it's funny diving into all this gear now because I always had someone who did this for me, and now I have to learn it all myself. But what's really cool, though, is our product manager figured out that you can put uh, diopters, you can put glass uh, or plastic elements in this, and I actually happen to have some right here. And uh, I actually made these, or had an optical lab made make these. This is just this is an eyeglass element. It's just an eyeglass optical lab. So this, that these they, are what you're showing us. You these are custom made just for you, right? Yeah, I just went in and said, I have this. I want a bunch of these uh, half diopter steps from I think plus one to plus three and minus one to minus three. Or actually, yes, yeah, that's accurate. And when you put these behind the signature primes, you can kind of tease out this uh, vintage lens look because you're you're basically screwing up the signature prime uh, in such a way that it matches what optical designers were able to do, you know, in the the forties, fifties, sixties, seventies when they were trying their best, but they couldn't quite get there you know that they were doing the best they could for their times but there there were still a lot of aberrations in what they were able to produce so this is a it's just polycarbonate it costs i don't know maybe 20 or 30 dollars to, to make this there's no anti-reflective coating on this because uh it would turn green which is not very pleasant yeah but you get some really interesting flares out of this and since it's polycarbonate i had them make this just about a half millimeter too big for the ring and you just Pop it in. Let's see. There it goes. Done. Done. And it, and you can get different effects depending on whether the curve is facing the back of the lens or facing the sensor. And you can experiment with that just by turning this around. So what you're but, showing is essentially like a DP could get scientific and kind of create their own look. So you have like the the lens, which is a modern easy to use repeatable as you know what you expect that mm -hmm. kind of functionality you would get or you might not get out of a vintage lens but you can then mess with the image in the rear of it to kind of create your own special sauce 
Right, because you can always make a good lens look bad. You can't always make a bad lens look good. And these lenses, we, as a company, we just don't make bad products. We make products that last and are relevant for 10, 15, 20 years, especially when it comes to lenses. So we weren't going to make something that had a lot of aberrational character in it because we just don't know how long that's going to be relevant, especially since with UHD and 4K projection and then 8K is coming, we just don't know what kind of what aberrations are going to look like. And, and personally, when I watch HDR and UHD TV and I see lens flares and aberrations, it, it, they just jump right out at me. So we wanted to make lenses that had character that would work with those display technologies. But at the same time, if you want to take your investment and kind of mess it up and make it vintage or just experiment, you can take an optical flat and put it back here and paint on it or sandblast it or scratch it up or, you know, draw on it with markers. You can do whatever you want. You know, there's only so much you can do at the rear of the lens, but we can't really let you get inside that lens because there's just so much stuff going on. Yeah. We can at least make it really easy for you to affect the back of the lens. Well, and, and it's not just about diopters. A lot of people use nets, um, maybe a color filter or whatever, but um, you were showing some examples um, that I sure. saw that I thought looked really interesting. The trick is you want the most matte uh, mesh possible because the shinier it is, um, the more you're going to get some interesting, um, hard to describe, but rainbow effects, yeah. which a lot of DPs really don't like. Um, you can use wedding veil, which it's a, it's a synthetic fiber that used to be really popular in the video world, but it's very shiny. It tends to give you a big cross. Mm -hmm. And which, what I really like are nets that give me um, kind of, a, it's like an octagonal weave. I mean, the more sides to it, the more you're going to get a glow. If you just have a weave like that, you're just going to get a cross. Yeah. And you know, you'll even see that on fluorescent lights and soft lights, and it doesn't always look that great. Uh, so you want a weave like bobbinet. I used to use bobbinet a lot, and that's the net that you see in grip flags and nets. And mm -hmm. if you look at that weave, it's I think it's hexagonal. It has six sides, and it glows beautifully. But you really do want that um, that matte finish. And that's why the old um, silk stockings were really popular because silk is very matte and it just glows. Uh, it doesn't give you, uh, it's not an artificial feel. It just kind of takes the edge off. Yeah. But, and what you can see is, you know, this is how the, the, the net attaches. There is a specific rubber band in the US. It's number 12 is the size. And I found them on Amazon. They're hard to find in office supply stores. But uh, on Amazon, I can find a bag of, you know, several thousand for next to nothing. And they work really well. Uh, it took me a while to figure out which ones to use. Um, so that's the fishing line trick. And you can see it's, it's a little bit rotated there. But uh, that's just a piece of uh, fishing line uh, oriented. Uh, probably it's going this way. So this is showing maybe one click to the right. OK. So if you oriented it with uh, you know if you oriented it with the witness mark and then rotated it one click to the right, you would get this rotation. Okay. And then you could very quickly do that across your whole range of lenses. But if you go, let's see. So this is this is uh, I was talking earlier about the curve. If the curve goes this way, you you get a really I I, I really like the effect when the curve is facing out the front of the lens. Now, the problem, though, is that some of the lenses uh, have rear elements that stick out. They, they bulge a little bit. So you have to be careful not to use too high a strength. If you go the other direction, then you're never going to touch the rear element. And then, you know, you're, you're always fine. You can't really damage the back of the, the lens with a plastic element. It just won't sit flush. And that it, you know, that can result in a little bit more unpredictability than maybe some people want. Mm -hmm. But here's an example. So this is uh, no uh, diffusion at all on a signature prime. And then this is a very light diffusion. I, this is black sparkle mesh. It's a costume fabric and it has a really random black weave to it. And I like it because if I shoot a specular highlight, uh, because the weave is kind of random, if the camera is moving, the highlight has a little life to it. It dances around a little bit. Uh -huh. 
It's really nice. But here it's just adding just a very, very, very light diffusion. Yeah. So now here, let, let's look at this is Fogel. So much stronger effect, much lower contrast. Everything feels much softer. There's mm -hmm. less resolution. It's got a little glow to it. But then here's the diopter. Bam. Wow. So this is really exaggerated. This is much uh, more intense than you would typically see in a vintage lens, but vintage lenses do this. You know, they tend to fall apart around the edges, especially when you're wide open. Mm -hmm. And you get this smeary effect and you get funky bokeh. I have some examples of that I can show you in a second as well. But this is kind of a classic vintage lens look. And you see this on the wider focal lengths typically. Um, but I, I went for the heaviest option just because I was trying to show the effect. Yeah, Probably yeah. Like wouldn't you, you wouldn't this necessarily screen. use this, the, the plus three on your, uh, you know, you wouldn't use the plus three on, on a movie or whatever, but you might use it for a special effect. But plus one or plus two might be much more used often, I guess. Yeah, this is like an insomniac dream sequence. This is yeah. really over the top. I'm, but uh, you know, it's cool that you can do that, but you can also kind of back off and really customize the look. And, and it's really cheap because at 20 or $30 a filter, you know, it's, it's nothing to just get a bunch made and then you've always got them. Now this is clean. Mm -hmm. And then here's the sparkle mesh. So actually I'll go back this, so you can see a little bit of the, uh, the effect on that, oh, I went the wrong way. There we go. On the house in the background, especially around that window, you can see a little bit of the contrast coming up when they change it. You can also see it on the front of the car. So go into black sparkle mesh. Mm -hmm. Everything kind of smooths out. It's a really interesting look. I actually, I, I really love. I really prefer the. Uh, I really prefer the black sparkle mesh over the, as the as the. It's a really nice image. It just kind of softens it and produces that what that uh, contrast. It's it nice. is nice. If you have a really hot light coming down the lens, you're going to get an overwhelming flare. If you're getting just little hits, it's really pretty because you'll get this uh, sparkle that uh, changes. Um, it kind of dances. It's almost like uh, light coming through water viewed from underneath the water. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it, it, it dances a lot. It's really nice. But if you hit it too hard, it can be a little overwhelming. Uh, here's the Fogel. So, you know, even softer, lower contrast. This is a pretty heavy effect, uh, especially in digital. In digital, I, I find the nets tend to photograph a little heavier. Film is an analog medium, so you kind of you have to hit it a little harder before you see this stuff. Yeah. Uh, digital, you see it a little quicker. And then here's the diopter. <laughs> So that's uh, that's a crazy look, but it's it's fun, you know. I mean, look at uh, you know this area over here on the top right, you know, where the image is really stretching out. Uh, and actually, I, let me let me switch, let me stop sharing real quick, and I'll show you some other examples that show this much more clearly. So this is a presentation we did for the American Society of Cinematographers. And uh, for this presentation, we, we got a, uh, a 10 by 20 foot translate from Roscoe. They loaned it to us, it was really nice of them. It, and this is perfect. A cityscape has enough texture that you can really see the effect of the diopter because the diopter does some really interesting things. But if you have a textured background, you're gonna see those things more quickly. For example, well, you know, here's, here's just clean. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the bokeh is very nice. It's very smooth. Um, it's circular in the center. At the edges of the frame wide open, you start getting a little cat's eye effect. That's typical for this, uh, you know, uh, for uh, signature primes. Uh -huh. It's normal. And actually, you see this on a lot of lenses when you're wide open, because the alternative is making really big lenses. Uh, <laughs> so, because typically if you, uh, if you make a lens, uh, a high-speed lens, uh, if you're looking through the lens dead on uh, with the aperture wide open, you'll see a circle of light. But if you move your eye off to the side, you start seeing a cat's eye effect because you're now looking through the back of the lens at an angle. And that's the way the edge of the sensor sees the world. Yeah. And if you close down a stop, then it goes away. But wide open, you can't avoid it, except in, unless you make the lens twice as big, which nobody wants. 
So you get a little bit of this cat's eye effect, but otherwise very, very, very smooth uh, look. Now, if we go to, let's go to something really extreme. Yeah, this is really nice. So if we go to minus 2.5, and a minus diopter, a negative diopter, is not something you see in photography very often at all. Like why would you use that? In the, in the front of a lens, you would never use that because it, all it does is it pushes your point of focus farther away. Yeah. But there are lenses that have this, this look. And it's a very soft, low contrast look in the center. And then at the edges, there's this interesting, I don't know what to call this. Um, I, I kind of call it the angel wing effect in a way, you know, because it's got this, this kind of smear. Yeah. Um, and it's almost like, and, and, oh, you can see it around the big highlights here. And it's almost like you're grabbing the image and you're, you're, you're kind of stretching the edges in towards the center. And the background textures feel a bit harder. And th this is a vintage lens look. There are vintage lenses that look just like this. Well, and it, it kind of pulls the eye in a little bit more to the center of the frame too. Yeah, absolutely. And it, 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 it's just, there, there's something really interesting and ethereal about it. You know, just looking at some of the stuff that's going on around the edges of the frame. It's just, uh, it's just a very different look. You know, in the center, uh, the bokeh is a little bit different. Um, it's not as is perfectly smooth. It's got maybe a little bit of a hot center to it, but then around the outside edges, you know, it sort of starts with a hot edge, a hot center, and then uh, it's almost as if it gets pulled into the center. Now, if we look at a negative, or no, I'm sorry, a positive. Oh, actually, okay, so this was interesting. So this was, that previous one was at minus 2.5 towards the sensor. Let's find a way from the sensor. Here we go. Oh, yeah. Look at that. Oh, wow. So that previous one, the plastic was aimed. Um, the, the curve of the diopter was aimed towards the sensor. Now we're aiming it away. We're aiming it towards the front of the lens. There's a lot more contrast around his face. It, it's still it's softer, but uh, it's not glowing anymore. Yeah. But now we've got this really interesting vintage lens effect where uh, the, the bokeh doesn't look like that. It doesn't have that angel wing uh, feel, but it does have a lot of texture to it because now we've introduced a lot of spherical aberration. Uh, the bokeh is darker in the center, and you can really see it in the center here. You can see that, that dark center and the rings. Mm -hmm. That's something you see in cook speed pancros. I mean, there's all sorts of, there's modern lenses that still do that, but a lot of vintage lenses do that as well. And yeah, also you really can see, see it on the left too. Yes. Yes. Over here in mm -hmm. this corner, there's a lot of that going on. And also you can see there's a lot of uh, chromatic aberration too. Mm -hmm. Now these lenses normally have almost neg negligible chromatic aberration, but you can see this, this orange edge on the inside of the bokeh. And it, uh, there's a, a, a slightly less obvious cool edge on the outside. And that's something you see in a lot of vintage lenses. Um, I've actually been watching a number of TV series with uh, uh, a certain anamorphic lens that's really come back into style. And it has a really hot red outside edge. So sometimes you can spot the lenses by how the chromatic aberration falls. But normally these lenses don't have this. And this is a really vintage lens look. Now let me see if I can find the positive because the the positive diopter. Let's see. Let's it's see. Actually, interesting. while you look for that, I'm just gonna talk real quick. It's just interesting sure. how you can take this very modern lens made to be delivering to a client um, high end, you know, beautiful imagery, but then you're also able to to kind of mess with it and play with it without having to hunt down expensive vintage lenses and then rehouse them or, or, or rehouse, you know, photo lenses like, um, like I, a friend of mine has a Canon 50 0.95, which has got a lot of these same problems, not problems, but Im like image qualities. Right. But you could kind of create that on your own and you could kind of be a little bit of a sign, a mad scientist with it to figure out what may best work for the story. 
Right. And, you know, the, you, you kind of said problems and, you know, from the perspective of an optical designer, these are all problems because they didn't really intend for lenses to look this way when they made them this way. They were just doing the best they could at the time. And now you know, optical design has is, is progressed to the point where we can actually create um, a completely different look. I mean, like I said earlier, we're, we're starting, we're doing the opposite now. We're starting with a really, really good lens and then we're customizing it rather than using the imperfections as a, a way of creating character. So we're starting with a really good lens, we're softening skin tones, we're uh, opening up mid-tones, we're, uh, we're adding a little glow to flares. We're, we're kind of introducing a uh, character that way rather than relying on the fact that maybe someone in the past couldn't do as good a job as they would like. But what we've done is recognize that DPs want to experiment. And if you have a, a really, really expensive lens that you've invested in for the long term, and these are 20 year investments, we also want to give you the flexibility to make it look like a lens that was popular 20 years ago, because Plus, why not? It's also, it's a repeatable thing. So if someone's like, hey, I really like that look you did on your reel, I want to see if you can take that further. Um, you don't have to go hunt down that lens you rented. You, right. you and have that's, all yes. the elements. That's a great point too, because uh, with some of those vintage lenses, no two may look the same. Yeah. So, you know, you may take one out. There was there was one time I remember shooting something with a, a, a Zeiss Super Speed and getting this beautiful bokeh uh, with a uh, hot center that bled off um, instead of, you know, the opposite of this donut bokeh. Yeah. Where, where you've got the hot outside. It was really amazing. And I've never seen that in a super speed sense. And it's driven me nuts. And I, I'm guessing that lens was just, you know, someone must have dropped it or something, but <laughs> it looked amazing. And I've never found another one with quite that same look. And it's been really frustrating. And it but can yeah. be it can be really disappointing as a DP, you, you've you created something and sometimes it's a happy accident. And you're like, I really like the way that looked. I really liked how that flare or that softness or that uh, lack of, contrast looked but then you go on to the next project and that lens is rented that for a month right. or someone bought it or they sold it and that that can send someone maybe me and it's a little bit of a creative tailspin because then you have to think of how else you're going to do it yeah absolutely and this is something that's already always bothered me um and one of the reasons i started writing for pvc a long time ago was because I just liked, uh, I liked drilling into things that affected me, but that I didn't really understand because I wanted to find ways to reproduce things that I, I liked. And sometimes it took a lot of work to figure out what those things were, whether it was the color of a camera or the look of a lens or the look of a light or a lighting technique or something, I would see something and find it really appealing. And then I wanted to find out how to repeat that because I didn't, I don't like happy accidents. I, I like happy accidents the first time, but after that, I want to be able to keep doing that. Yeah. Whatever that thing is. Well, and, so, and another thing is like, you, not everyone can afford signature primes. I mean, yeah. Just, so you might be, you might be renting them on a project and finding Signature primes, is it going to be a lot easier than finding a 50 millimeter cinematized Canon F0.95? Yes. And and you can then keep your your diopters you've had made, your nets. And and so you you now have your toolbox that can literally be in a small toolbox that you can take with you and make these lenses unique for you on any given product, on project. Yeah, I, I went through a phase... Uh, as a DP where I shot a lot of projects on rehoused cook speed pancros. And those are really interesting lenses because I guess some of the, either the glass or the coatings on some of the lenses is radio radioactive and the 152 is particularly so, and they tend to turn bright green. So you've got a set of lenses that don't color match because the coatings have shifted. Uh, and in some cases they've shifted uh, I mean, they've definitely shifted within the set, but then across sets, they don't match either. 
So for a commercial, maybe you want to spend the time to get in there and do color correction and take the green out of that one lens uh, and you know maybe the yellow out of another and you know and mess around like that. But if you're doing a TV series or a feature, that's 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 an unfortunate thing. You know, you 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 don't get a lot of color correction time. Yeah. And personally, I would prefer a colorist to spend their time creating and maintaining a look rather than fixing discrepancies between lenses. Yeah. So, and, and you can also have to deal with the fact that like, um, you don't want somebody like, Hey, why is that shot green? Right. You don't want that. You don't want that text message or that phone call that suddenly someone's upset that one lens is green. Oh, I, I was like, when, back when I was a camera assistant, I, uh, almost got, uh, fired with the DP uh, because they were screening dailies during the day while we were working and we couldn't see them. And we kept hearing all these rumors that the dailies are green, the dailies are green and they were going to fire us. So one day we finally got them to screen the dailies after work and we went in there and yeah, the dailies are green. And I just, I stood up and said, you know, turned to the DP and I said, you didn't have any green lights in there, did you? He says, no, they're all tungsten. So there's no way these could be green. No, there's no reason. There's no reason for these to be green at all. So we basically took the took the negative off to another uh, another lab and uh, had them color correct it. And hey, everything was fine. Yeah. So you know, st stuff like that can. And sometimes you don't even know why. You just get a call saying, "Don't come back tomorrow." Yeah. Or, uh, or the after project no call, ever. Yes. Oh <laughs> yeah. Ghost. Those are those are bad too. You think you've done an amazing job and then. You never hear from that client again. So what we're seeing here, uh, what you're showing is it's a very, I can see all the images go, all the lines going towards the actor here, the subject. And this is, um, this kind of makes me think about certain like photo lenses, mm -hmm. the older photo lenses that can really pull your eye into the center. And it's a, it's a, it's, I mean, especially if you have like say a romantic interest story and this is a romantic interest for someone that it, the visuals now match the story very simply. Yeah, actually, let me find the clean version of this because we may see that just with the lens on its own. Okay. Um, you see, you'll see a little bit of that here. So you can see the cat's eye around the outside. Yeah, but it's not as strong as the last image. Right, because what, what we're going for with the native look of the lens is to, the bokeh is, is just almost unnaturally smooth. And there's this, uh, uh, it, it's hard to describe, but it, it's just, it's so smooth you get an extra uh, bit of, um, to me it feels like there's more depth separation because there aren't any hard lines in the background for me to grab onto. And then if you have a lot of texture in the background, you do get this kind of swirling effect. But if you go and look at, well, here, let's look at, yeah, there you go. There's the plus 2.5. You do feel a lot of texture in it now. And there's a little bit of that pulling in towards the center. Mm -hmm. um, let me find a more dramatic example because that is two sensor. Let's find away from sensor because that's probably going to be really strong and crazy. Oh, yeah, here we go. Oh, yes. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, and especially if we go over here. That's almost like a pretzel lens from like the turn of the century. Oh, the Petzval. Petzval. I can't say it. I'm from the South, so I'm going to mispronounce a bunch <laughs> of stuff. I like the pretzel lens. That's kind of interesting. <laughs> huh. You've given me some ideas. But yeah, 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 this is this is that instead of the the very smooth look, everything's kind of being pulled in, which is a really neat effect. Uh, you won't see it as strongly um, on the longer lenses because you get most of that effect towards the edges of the frame, where the 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 diopter really starts messing with how the light reaches the lens. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're shooting through the center of it, you're not really getting to the, the outside edges where the effect is really strong, but it's still interesting. Uh, let's see what else we got here. How about a negative?
Yeah, so this is this is given us, uh, you know, in some ways it's not as obvious, but uh, there's a lot more texture back there. So yeah. this is kind of a coarser look. I, I really, what's interesting with that one, because it's a little coarser, it, it kind of makes him look like he is on top of that building in that cityscape a little bit more. How do, how do you mean on top? You mean closer? Well, no, no, like like he's in that space, like in, on top of a... You know, like on a balcony on top because of like the 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 trans light is not it just looks more real. Oh, because it's less perfect, it feels more real. Yeah, so the harder oh. edges make it look like he's on that you know mythical building in that city with you know Italian lights behind them. I don't know what it, I think. I think it's because of the the bouquet, and I don't know what it is. It's really kind of making me jump there, and maybe I'm just wrong and not right on that one. No, that's I I love hearing that stuff because then I'm I'm driven to find out why. Uh, I mean, I you know, oh, I have something I can show you. Maybe it's because it's not smooth, like you said. Maybe the bouquet is not so smooth. So I discovered something really interesting about how lenses roll out of focus because I had a DP look at these and say. Oh, these lenses roll out of focus really quickly. And I, I didn't know what that meant. So what I did was I found this distortion chart. Can you see that? Yes, I can. Okay. So I found this distortion chart in uh, actually in our server room. Uh, it's just a four by eight chart that we would pull out once in a while to uh, help people map lenses. Um, because when you're when you're compositing, say, a, a digital character into a um, um, a real scene, like a real background plate, you have to map your digital element through the dist the distortions of that lens in order to make it look like it actually belongs in the scene. Yeah. So what you do is you you shoot a map like this, and you can very quickly see where the distortions are. And then you can create, you know, a digital map that will introduce those um, the same characteristics uh, digitally into a, you know, a foreground element that you're compositing in. Now, normally you shoot this dead on, but I shot it at an angle because I figured I could see it roll out of focus really quickly. Yeah. So this is what I saw. So this is four different lenses. And I sorted them in order of how they roll out of focus. The signature prime is at the top, and it's the softest. Uh, there's another lens. It's a, a slightly vintage lens. Uh, you know, there's the next one down. It, it's it's soft. It's not as soft. And then there's a, a rehoused original Cook Speed Pancro, third down, and it's surprisingly hard. Mm -hmm. And then this other lens, lens Y. Uh, that's a really funky old vintage lens, and it's it's really um, it's really hard the way it rolls out of focus. I mean, all I have to do is look at that, and you can very quickly see. Yeah. And that's that texture that you're seeing in the back in the background. That donut bokeh. The more of that donut bokeh there is in a lens, the more of that spherical aberration there is, the more uh, the quality of how it rolls out of focus has changed. Now, the, tr the trick is if you have that donut in the background, you always have that other thing that I described uh, earlier where you, uh, you have the hot center. So that, that bleeds off. And that's what we're seeing over here. Okay, yeah, yeah. That hot center bokeh blends really beautifully. But it always comes with, you know, the other side is always going to be the donut. And the donut has a much harder feel to it. Yeah. So that was really fascinating to me to learn that there is something to when a, a DP says, oh, these roll out of focus quickly or, or slowly or something like that. Uh, there is something to that. And it tends to have a lot to do with spherical aberration. And that's what we were seeing. Let me, uh, let me try to go back to uh, uh, that other image. Let's see, let me find it. Here it is. And that's what we're, we're seeing in this image, that hardness here. And then actually, you know, the harder that image, let's see, let's find something that's really, oh, 
let's go wide. We'll see it more on the wide end. Let me find a way from sensor. Slating, slating trick for everyone, you know, every second assistant out there, make sure the frame is, or the, uh, the slate is in the shot. When you roll the camera, it makes things a lot easier for the editor. Yeah. So, but you can feel this hardness in here. Can you switch it so we can see that full frame? Yeah, you can, you can see how much texture and how much harder this feels in the background. And, and that's what we were seeing in that other image. Um, the, you know, the fact that we have so much spherical aberration that we, we've introduced by putting this diopter behind the lens means that when the background goes out of focus, you've got this dark center and this hot edge. Mm -hmm. That makes everything feel much harder. Detail is retained. If you had the opposite of that, or if you do, if you have what signature primes usually do, which is just a, the, the bokeh is just very even and smooth, um, there are no hard edges for your eye to grab onto anymore. So that, that texture kind of melts away. And the idea behind that is that your, your eye naturally goes to the, the point of focus because your eye is attracted by hard edges and contrast. But, but then, but then if you're doing like, um, if you want a scene to feel like you're shooting it, you're faking it, you're shooting on a, you know, background or whatever, and you need it to feel real, like you really are worried about that, then that smoothness kind of makes it feel, you know, a little less real and that, that hardness on the background, to me at least, made it feel mm -hmm. more, more like the trick had been played on me and it, it was, it did in fact look kind of real. Yeah, I mean, to me, it's, it's more about, um, you know, when I see that smooth quality, I think large format because there's so much depth separation. Yeah. And I, I really like that. And I, I actually feel that with these lenses in uh, Super 35 because I've shot footage on a regular mini, not even an LF mini. Mm -hmm. And I, that because the background rolls out so quickly, um, it almost feels like things are on a separate plane. And to me, that's the large format look. It's there's a something that is not necessarily sharp, but clear, like I like I'm looking at it in the foreground. And then the background is so soft that it just feels almost like a like the like a different layer in Photoshop. Yeah, yeah. There's that certain smooth. I mean, it's very attractive. The large format look is very attractive, and I mean, it's just creamy, buttery, beautiful. Um, I, the only reason I mentioned that selling the effect is if you need to really, if something's like not working the way you want it to work, which is what happens to me more than likely than mm -hmm. happens to you because my skills are probably nowhere near yours. Eh, you never know. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have taken a long time talking about diopters and, and nets and everything you can do behind the lens. Are, is there anything we're missing about you were kind of put dip, dipping our toes in the water, but people do have to watch this. We, we're not going to give them a three hour long movie on, right. uh, on our conversation. I could do that. Stop me now. Yeah. But uh, is there anything you want to touch on before we leave? No, I think that's it. There's, uh, there's, there's plenty more, but I think that's probably a lot to think about right now. I mean, it's, it's just, it's fun to be able to experiment and, you know, there's lots of options if you if you want to experiment with vintage lenses, but you really have to go to those vintage lenses. And each set is going to be different. Each type of lens uh, is going to be different, and then each set of those lenses is typically going to be different. And what we've tried to do is, first of all, give you the best we can give you uh, for the money that you're going to spend for signature primes, either renting or buying. But we also want to give you the flexibility to then, you know, consistently re uh, create and repeat looks. And you can make your own looks. You can experiment. I'm just showing you these plastic diopters. You can put all sorts of other things back there, and it's really, it's really super easy. Um, you can have a, a bunch of these all made up. Every lens comes with one of these, but you can buy more, and you can just have them ready to go as your own personal customized behind the lens, you know, filter and optics kit. So, yeah, it's just, you know, we're always looking for that way to push looks just a little bit further, so. Well, you guys are giving cinematographers and uh, DPs a, a lot of tools 
to make a lot of beautiful imagery. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you.